Capella might just be the most twisted Archbishop Subaru's faced yet. On top of her sadistic desire to be loved by everyone, her psychotic behavior won't even allow Subaru to reset. It's a new challenge making it seem increasingly likely whatever happens in this loop might just end up being permanent. Subaru's encounter with Gluttony isn't to be overlooked either, but a large portion of this video will focus on her. The Sin Archbishop of Lust, Capella Amarada Lagunica. I'll properly explain the full extent of her abilities, along with the raw, uncut logic behind why she does what she does. It's a bit more than just wanting to be loved by everyone. So, let's take a look at this crazy episode of ReZero and see exactly what it is the anime left out from it. Alright, I know you know who this iconic bunny girl is, so I'm sure you already guessed this video was sponsored by Arknights. They've been kind enough to hit me up again, so if you're looking for a new fantasy-themed strategic mobile RPG, then this right here is it. It's got an amazing story, although sometimes very emotional, fantastic gameplay with an ever-growing cast of characters, then constant updates always expanding that story. The newest update brings us episode 14, which is a main story event titled Absolved Will Be the Seekers, a very epic-looking continuation to the long-awaited climax of Act 2. From it, you can get the free 6-star operator Civilite Eterna, who, in addition to being very new player-friendly, is also a great healer and buffer to have. There's also the new limited 6-star sniper Wishadel, then the elite caster operator Logos. Wishadel's the new renamed version of the mercenary leader W, and her new skills overcome several of the limitations Flingers have had before. Logos is a lot more versatile with his skills, but what appeals to me more is his VA Jun Fukuyama. I don't know about you, but for me, anyone sharing Lelouch's voice actor is gonna sound amazing. So, if you download Arknights now, then you'll be able to start earning these limited time login rewards too. A total of 10 days that gives you summons, an event limited skin, a brand new lobby scene, and more. Then, a special access pass grants even more on top of that. So, whether you want to experience the brand new storyline, buff your roster with new 6-star operators, or simply claim all the free rewards, you can jump into Arknights for free using my link down in the description. But now, let's get back to the video. Episode 55, Muddy Stream. Covering Chapter 5 from Volume 17 of the Light Novel and Chapter 1 from Volume 18. To start with Gluttony's unexpected arrival, as soon as Subaru knew it was him, he wasted no time unleashing the fastest and strongest whip attack he'd ever produced. In fact, this was without a doubt the greatest blow Subaru had ever mustered in his entire life. The impact would have gouged out skin and flesh alike, but somehow Roy managed to catch it effortlessly. Krush had engaged just like we saw next, but in addition to those invisible slashes of wind, she also followed it up with a close-range sword thrust. It was a charge that seemed sure to impale the target in front of her, but once again, Roy had avoided it like it was nothing. With an inhuman display of acrobatics, Roy twisted his body in a way that shouldn't have been possible, then deflected Krush's blade with only his fingertips. It was a counter only made possible by his concealed weapons known as the Tiger Claws, the purple extensions we see him wearing on each of his fingers here. He would then go for a counterattack on Krush, which actually would have hit had Subaru not moved her out of the way with his whip. With him literally carrying her again now, Subaru would run away serving as the decoy for Gluttony to give chase after. This in turn created an opening for Julius, allowing him to land a direct hit on Gluttony. Unfortunately, drawing a little blood wouldn't be enough to stop him, as by the time Julius had prepared his next attack, Roy was already on his feet moving again. So, even with Julius pressing the attack with a relentless fury of sword strikes, Roy's feral movements were just too hard to keep up with. As we saw in the anime though, it didn't matter if Julius could land a hit or not, so long as Roy was occupied, Krush and Subaru could go achieve their primary goal. That was easier said than done though, since for both Subaru and Krush, ignoring Gluttony was incredibly difficult. I mean, he was the singular goal Subaru had been pursuing for the past year. Time and time again, he'd dreamt of getting the chance to confront Gluttony like this, but now that that chance was finally here, he wasn't even able to stick around for it. It was an awful feeling knowing he'd have to let such an opportunity slip through his fingers like this. What had helped him to get over it was the extremely powerful look of conviction Krush gave him while he was contemplating it. It had reminded Subaru that he wasn't the only one affected by Gluttony. As someone who personally had her memories stolen by him, she too knew the key to getting her old self back was standing right in front of them. 
Even so, the choice she needed to make was clear. Fulfilling her duty would always come before helping herself. Even if it meant continuing to live in a world that was blank when it shouldn't be, that was a price she was willing to pay if it meant helping the people. So, as much as their hesitation, reluctance, and regrets encouraged them otherwise, Subaru and Krush knew they both lacked the time and strength to defeat Roy right now. They knew the only right choice was to pursue their true target. So, it was upon crashing into Capella's base of operations that the first thing Subaru would notice would be the media. It was the most peculiar one he'd seen to date. As a device that expanded and enhanced the user's voice, the fact it was shaped like some kind of pipe organ really intrigued Subaru more than it should have. It was a machine solely powered by the magic crystals embedded right into it. The dragon quickly grabbed Subaru's attention after, and Krush's assault on it was way more brutal than what we saw. She didn't hold back, even for a second. She even got up close and kicked it right in the chest, sending the dragon stumbling backwards from the sheer immense force of it. Now, knowing how this dragon was probably just a human transmutated by Capella, it makes me feel bad for whoever it was before. They probably just wanted help, and Krush just started wailing on them. Subaru would then discover what the sounds he previously heard on the broadcast was, rendering him speechless in a way that was well highlighted in the anime. What they didn't show after, though, was Capella stomping hard on Krush after being rendered unconscious. She was convulsing from the mix of blows and whatever Capella had done to leave her like this, likely poisoned as Subaru could notice a fang-like tooth poking out of Capella's mouth. The moments after were very much faithful to the novel, all the way up to Capella's transmutative counterattack. It was the first time she'd displayed the full extent of her powers as lust. To explain it in the words she herself considers best though, it all stems from the very reason she exists. An existence where all she wants is to monopolize all the world's love and admiration for herself. This in turn makes her the ultimate manifestation of any aesthetic that can possibly exist, and it's through that that she alone can answer anyone's most perverse desires. She'll take the form of the most beautiful person according to whoever's tastes, since, as the one who deserves to be loved the most, she also takes great effort to ensure that she is loved. That's just how devoted she was to receiving it. Such words terrified Subaru down to his core, since as he came to understand it himself, her powers were by far the worst thing possible. They enabled her to violate any and everyone's system of values. So, as something that was being used by someone so morally bankrupt, a horrible conclusion finally dawned on Subaru. Her ability to transmute and transform wasn't just limited to herself. It was a disturbing revelation that finally made everything make sense for him. The unnatural buzzing he heard during the broadcast wasn't just the random sounds of insects, it was the transformed humans flapping their wings desperately crying for help. With wings that couldn't even let them fly, it was the only thing they could do given their new inhuman form. So this solidified Capella's position as a villain amongst villains since, just like the other archbishops, her twisted nature was simply evil. They all were. Wrath toyed with emotions and focused solely on her own self-centered love, greed forced his values onto others while placing himself above them, Gluttony stole people's names and memories trampling on their existence, then Capella simply spat upon the values any normal human knew to respect. She blotted them out in a way that was straight up unforgivable. Now, it was as Capella explained why she did what she did that all the while she'd continue transforming into someone different. It had made Subaru unsure as to who he was even talking to anymore. When it came down to it though, the basis of her logic was that people can't live without loving someone. Since they can't love something that's strange or revolting either though, by process of elimination, it also meant they can't live without loving something they can love. This was the maxim by which Capella lived her life by. A comprehension of love she referred to as if it was the greatest discovery ever made. The whole thing was spoken with reasonably sounding logic, but just like all the other archbishops before her, that logic was built upon pure insanity. They were psychotic words that made Subaru just want to run away. Capella wasn't done there though, as she still had more to say with regards to why she was doing everything. To put it as simply as possible, it was all because she loved them. Out of a deranged compassion for everyone around her, she in turn wanted to do everything to make everyone love her. It was all part of her desire to drown in the love of many. That was who she was. 
So, as a person that wanted to monopolize all the love in the world for herself, that meant she needed to put in every effort to be loved. It was a process that included turning herself into whatever image best suited the person she was appealing to. Her goal was to make everyone look at her, robbing them of their interest in anything else. This, of course, included Subaru too, so even if he was just one person, Lust wanted to make him love her too. It's actually the reason why she refused to kill him here. Since all she was about was making people love her, despite Subaru being nothing but a useless sack of meat, he did still have value so long as his love was focused on her. That's just how strong her desire for recognition was. So, as far as we know with regards to her motives right now, all Capella wants is for one more person to tell her how much they love her. That was supposedly all she was asking for. Keeping that in mind then, Capella's next form was a display intended to show just how hard she was working to be loved by Subaru. She then went on a rant comparative to Echidna's back in Season 2, listing off every possible reason one might claim to love someone. It was truly extensive and seemingly unending, each reason changing her expression for the worst the more she continued. In the end, it was all to express how all of it was, well, bullshit, and how to her, the only thing that mattered was visual stimulation. If it didn't, then she was more than willing to put the whole would you love me if I was a fly argument to the test for real. It was actually a test Subaru had unknowingly already failed since his disgust for the flies in the other room was stated loud and clear. So this was the logic Capella abided by and the values she decided to pursue as the Archbishop of Lust. Now, fast forward to when Subaru was slowly dying and the tainted blood Capella decided to mix with his started overriding him into something that wasn't him. The feeling he felt was no longer pain or agony, but instead fear that originated from a different dimension entirely. In this moment, what was happening to Subaru was terrifying. Not because death was right around the corner for him, but instead because death was being withheld from him. For the first time, his opponent refused to let him die. That's pretty much where the whole Capella incident comes to an end, so if we were to focus on one of the many other incidents happening across the city, Amelia's capture is probably the best. The others are a bit more disjointed with where they're at, so for them it makes more sense to wait before talking about their stories. So, to focus on Amelia, her initial thoughts here were that she'd been saved by Subaru. She was kind of hoping that that wasn't the case though, since after talking all tough and convincing Subaru to let her fight, it would be way too mortifying to know he had to save her anyway. Now, being naked didn't stop her from actually getting up and investigating where she was, since despite Anna Rose's best efforts to make her more reserved, this to her was an emergency. She decided that even if she was completely naked, she needed to figure out what the current status was. This led her into the halls with only a blanket on, resulting in her first formal meeting with Regulus, a person she barely recognized as the man she bumped into on the street. She doesn't know he's one of the archbishops attacking the city, nor does she remember him as this person from her past. Regulus would then approach Amelia similarly to the way Subaru would himself, but the key difference in the way both of them acted was the lack of warmth Regulus carried when he was speaking to her. There was no compassion or consideration behind any of the words he spoke. None of the flattery she would usually receive when Subaru spoke. So, it was from this alone that Amelia now had a strange impression of Regulus, leading her to feel like something was deeply wrong. She couldn't quite pinpoint what it was, but something about this man seemed eerily familiar. From a distant corner of her mind, there was this vague feeling that she'd met him somewhere. In any case, there was an uncomfortable intensity with the way Regulus proceeded to ask the question. He first grabbed Amelia by the shoulder, brought himself practically face to face, then asked the question he'd asked all his other wives before her. The reason for such wasn't out of vulgar curiosity though, but was rather simply to confirm the sanctity of the powerful bond they were about to commit to. If they were going to embark on a journey of mutual love and understanding, then both parties needed to fully entrust themselves to each other. It was the only way Regulus believed that they could maintain their relationship. So, with Regulus now closer than he was before, once again, everything about him started stirring the depths of Amelia's memories. His figure, his voice, and his mannerisms all jogged a part of her memory she didn't even know she had. It was a presence almost identical to the menacing feeling she got when facing off against the horde of rabbits. Luckily, Amelia's response was more than acceptable, even going so far as to open up Regulus's third eye for him. 
What I mean is that Amelia just made it a whole lot more difficult to become one of Regulus's wives now. Before, he'd always used this question as a metric to measure his wife's purity, but now that Amelia had given him an answer he didn't even know was possible, this was the new standard of purity all his future wives would have to live up to. It wasn't enough to just be pure physically anymore. No. For Regulus, their very heart needed to be pure as well now. To even know of the concept that he was asking of, well, that would mean that they were just too impure for him. So, this was the new standard Regulus had come to accept here. Anything else would just diminish the value of the position he was offering. But yeah, that's everything we missed from episode 5. There wasn't really much in terms of whole entire scenes cut, but I hope these extra details did give you a bit more appreciation for the villains. Capella's character is certainly an interesting one, and I can't wait to see what it is that she really wants. But anyway, if you missed last episode then you can watch that here, or if you want to see Danmachi cut content then you can watch that here. Until next time though, Ciao!